Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to the Para Connection Podcast. You're here with Shuler, and today we have an amazing podcast to go over with you. On today's episode, we have a special guest by the name of David Omen. For those of you that may not know David, he is a paranormal enthusiast, historian, and someone that's quite familiar and close to the Sharon Tate murders. So while speaking with David, the team and I were able to discuss with him quite a few different things, such as going back in time to learn about the history and hauntings of Cielo Drive. Now while talking with David, we covered much more than just the hauntings and history. David shares with us many events that takes place before and after Sharon Tate's murder. These events prove to be quite important, of course, because of their relation with Charles Manson and his cult, better known as the family. What really struck a chord with us was the connection and experiences that David had with the Manson family. Such a connection that dug so deep that it led David on a path to create and publish his own book based upon these events. This episode was so amazing with all the rich history and supernatural experiences that David shared with us. I mean, we spoke with David well over three hours about his stories from Cielo Drive. And with that being said, what we've decided to do actually is break this episode down into a three-part mini-series, marking this episode as our first official mini-series. So without further ado, let's get this podcast rolling and visit the history of Cielo Drive. Andy has been telling us a lot about your recent book that you brought out. Oh, well, thank you very much. How do you, uh, how, what, so what, what are your thoughts on it so far? Well, I, like I said, I absolutely loved it. Love the detail. I also, I found it very, very interesting. I love how the, uh, the, a lot of the stuff about the murders and your life kind of intertwine. Yeah. And yeah, that was very, very interesting to me because, I mean, there was a lot going on there that that was, was, was very, very strange, but also interesting at the same time. Like the fact that uh, they would go into your house at night and like rearrange things, um, which I thought was, a very strange initiation type yeah. of thing. Um, and I also found it interesting that you and your mother used to actually give rides to a lot of the Manson family. Yeah, it was strange. I mean, and it wasn't like they were the only hitchhikers that she would give rides to. I mean, it was like, and it, it, when I wasn't, I wasn't always with her in the car, but on those occasions that I remember, it was burned in my memory specifically that those girls, amongst all the other people that she had, the hitchhikers, and again, there were always girls that she would give hitchhiker that were hitchhiking up to go up Bellagio Road from down on um, Bel Air, that I would just remember those, those few incidents and those girls, it was like I'd look in their eyes and I was going, I, 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 it, and again, to this very day, it's hard to describe that kind of um, that kind of look in their eyes. I mean, they used to call it the ten thousand mile stare because it was from Vietnam, and you know, uh, determined to be a. So they used to call it shell shock in World War II, as my dad used to say. And they hadn't quite put it together that this was post traumatic stress syndrome, which we later now understand it to be. But it was that look of just like contentment and I want to say unbridled euphoria with and it wasn't it wasn't like they were high like they were like like oh wow and it was like they were completely coherent and focused but it was almost like eerie well as as in the book I relate the connection scene the only time I remember ever seeing that similar type of a, a look 
was later on about five, six years later in the, in the mid 70s when the Hare Krishnas were big, big, big in going to proselyte, proselytizing people in the airports and you'd literally walk through the airports and there'd be people there dressed from head to toe. They were always bald. I'll never forget them as well, but bald all dressed in like sheets, like like white sheets or robes and whatever, and always clanking the the, the, the symbols between their fingers and, and chanting as they were walking through the airports, and you know looking for people to give to get donations from for the Hare Krishnas and spreading the word of Hare Krishna, and um, they're well beyond you. They were that their attention and that their focus was in some other place that they were here, but they really weren't here. That's the closest I could ever remember having a, a similarity between A and B and saying, wow, that reminded me of that from then. And then, like I said, the fact that probably six months after the murders, in the middle of, uh, not six months after, six months after the discovery of the murders, so say mid-July of 1970, which the Manson family was still quite together outside of the one those that had gotten put into jail which was manson tex watson um and the three and, and the four or five different girls that there were the three girls that were there well four because well it was three girls that were there one of them was kasabian and she turned state's evidence diana lake who i later met last year she had already turned state's evidence they weren't there but the rest of them were still on Spawn Ranch. They were still living there. They were still carrying out his orders. They still had communication lines between the, I should say, between Manson and those incarcerated and the outside world. And he was still getting messages back and forth. And apparently I found out from Diane Lake last year that the attorney that worked for Manson, one of the attorneys was basically passing messages back and forth between the family and Manson, who was in prison. So he was still doing, you know, directing orders and stuff. So if you think just, the whole idea was that Manson's whole purpose of doing that was to carry out the activities that were taking place before he was incarcerated and continue them through, even though he was incarcerated, kind of like the same reason why one of the um, theories behind Gary Hinman murder, and his nickname with the family was Cupid, um, uh, B Bobby Beausoleil. Oh. That if Bobby Beausoleil was in jail and this murder had taken place and Bobby's in jail, how, how could the murders continue with Sharon Tate and the La Biancas the following night if Bobby Beausoleil is in jail, how could the murder still be continuing and he still be in jail? And that was the whole point somebody theorized as to why they committed the Sharon Tate murders was so that they could get away with trying to say, well, if Bobby's in jail, how come they still murders that are just identical to that still happening? So the police would say, oh, we have the wrong guy. He's in jail, but the murders are still continuing. Uh-oh, we better release him. And that was one of the motivations, they say. And so it made sense to me, but I didn't, again, I remember in 1970, 71, there was no, I, nobody outside of the family members knew that they were perpetrating Creepy Crawl. And what's interesting the hell, hell about that is, is that when I read the book in 70, uh, 77 or 78, when I was in high school, it like went, bam, oh my God, that's exactly what the hell happened at my parents' house. And that's and, and and again in 1978. So that's eight years after the incident. You know, it's like holy crap. And my mom, and you know, because I talked to my sister about it. My sister, who's a few years older, says, "I don't remember any of that." I said, "Susan, you weren't there the day that it happened that morning." And mom certainly wasn't one to sit there and um, how should I say, be dramatic. All right, fine, it happened. Fine. It's a good thing you didn't wake up in the middle of the night blah, 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 that's it, over. You know, never knowing the connection back to the Manson family and the fact that she had given those kids rides some, you know, year earlier, that that was the telltale reason why it was that her house was picked. And again, when she would stop in front of her house, in front of the house and say, all right, girls, this is as far as I go. This is my house. This is where I live. The hell was she having to do that for? I mean, it was so nonsensical. It was is is 
I have to say, as, as about, about 25 years ago, I, was a, I had a private investigation process serving company. And, um, well, 30, well, 35 years ago, actually, is when it started. But the idea was that I gained so much understanding about information and the importance of information because we're talking about prior to the internet and just realizing that, you know, set, how does you say, nondescript bits of information have a way of finding their way back to you. And there was no reason for her to sit there and say, well, this is my house. She just said, this is the, this is where, this is around where I live. I'm going to drop you off here. You can walk up the street because you've taken care of the first, the three quarters of a mile up the steepest part of the, the canyons to get up to this place. It's easy for you to get around the corner to go up to Jan Barry's house. And I think about it now saying, yeah, how else would they have known this was the house they knew to target? They knew the people that lived there. My mom had shown in her generosity to say, look, this is as far as I can go, you can walk up. They were always so nice and they said, thank you very much, Mrs. Oman. And it was almost like that, um, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, that my, my lip service. The same thing with the, with the Manson girls, they were like, they knew how to portray or project an image of humble, you know, non, you know, whatever type of a uh, personality. And it's just amazing when you think about it, because they were con artists. They were complete con artists. That's it. So, David, do you think that they were strictly brainwashed, or do you think there was something to do with, like, spiritual oppression? No, honestly, neither, neither, nor, neither drugs, not brainwashed. You know, this is something that I, 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 I love, I mean, I'm a history buff, and I love looking backwards, and I think that part of the problem with, with human beings are that we take present day conventions and try to, this is 1860, well, that don't apply to them because their perception and comprehensions were different than what you now know. So you can't take present day and, and say, okay, we're gonna overlay it. No, it doesn't work. And since I was alive then, and I had a sister who was eight years older, and I knew all this stuff, and saw this stuff firsthand, every fucking myth about the Sharon Tate murder, murderers is a crock. They weren't brainwashed. They weren't uh, inundated with, bombarded with LSD. They weren't, it wasn't the, the fact that they were spiritually moved. It has to do with the dynamic and things that people don't want to talk about on a psychological level, which was apparently very much present then. There was something called, which we, we've lost to the to, to history, so to be called the generation gap. And it was more prevalent then in the sense that you got to remember the kids, the parents of these kids came out of World War II. They were kids when they, in World War II, so they went through the struggles and the strife of that. So their perception was very, very rigid and very much in this type of a hot, rigid, segmented type of a uh, of an understanding of life, of right and wrong. And it was very, very, as used to do this, square, very, very much. So when the kids came out in the, of the 50s, that were like the teenagers of the 50s and going into the little, you know, the, the, the teen boppers of the 50s that became the, the teens, the, you know, the young adults of the 60s like them, there was a lot of tension and, and this, a lot of friction between the older established generation and the youth generation of the culture. And as I remember seeing firsthand from my parent, my friends, at my friend's brother, my friends, I go to my friend's house and his father was a corporate type, just like the guy from Mad Men. He come, I was at their house, you know, hanging out and I remember several times he, the father would come home, go get himself right into the goddamn bar, set himself a gosh darn drink at 5.30, get himself nice and liquored up. And then, you know, then the, the, the rebellious son. And that's the thing, there's a lot of difference in the, the way that we treat our, the, the parents treat kids nowadays has learned from those experiences, so that's not the case. But back in the 60s, there was this tremendous counterculture. You're, you're smoking pot, well, you're bad. No, alcohol is my choice of drugs. But the adults weren't capable of admitting that this was their drug, was the alcohol. And it was it was legal, where the kids were doing things that they didn't want to follow in lines with the parents because the parents they were trying to move away from that type of mentality against the parents. So there's a great vast void between the adults and the kids. And in a lot of cases, the, the fragment, fragmentation of the, of the family 
in that era was even more disparate. So you had a lot of kids that were running away from their parents and running away from this kind of uh, regimented, strict authoritarian square type of a lifestyle. And they were running from it. So these kids were running away from, from a family looking for a family. And in the 60s, the, the youth movement, if you remember, was getting into, the, the counterculture was getting into these small little, you know, you don't want to call them cults, but co-ops, where they would all get together and were supporting each other because they felt that they were capable of having trust with them, having something, connect a connection with them, and having a an appreciation of their youth and enjoyment of these new recreational drugs that were available. And you gotta remember, until 1967, LSD was legal. That's the whole thing. It's just like back in the 80s when um, Molly, before it was MDMA, was legal and people were, were taking it and it was available. But when it became illegal, it became even more exploded because of the illegality of it. Um, in the sense that in the 60s, these people were getting, were in communes, thank you, Sean. They were getting into the communal groupings. Well, Manson provided a similar type of a, an environment, except it was a pseudo type of an environment because Manson was a con artist. And he saw, he goes, what's interesting? What can I take from what's not? He goes, wait a second. When he got out of jail, he was popped right down in San Francisco in the middle of the Bay Area, during the middle of the heyday of this stuff. And he started saying, he, as, a, as a sociopath, he wasn't a psychopath. And what people seem to think, he's a psychopath. No, 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 no. Two different things and two different approaches, psychologically speaking. A sociopath is a narcissist who gets other people to do his bidding and he can tell them what to do and he is hands free but he enjoys the puppetry of the mind yeah. of controlling people the sociop the psychopath is the exact opposite he doesn't look for others to do his bidding his gratification and interest and fulfillment is from his own gratification of getting it getting his kids on doing it himself not others he's not interested in mind control he's interested in controlling people himself directly and being in the mix directly that's why psychopaths are usually your serial killers your um mass murderers your shooters those kind of things sociopaths don't like that they like the control they like to play the game they like to be hands off and he was a sociopath and he played he preyed upon society's weeks weakest of all and these were kids so he basically created this communal type of an affair and in the guise of that he got them to basically feel that he was their father figure he gave them love he gave them security he gave them a sense of purpose he gave them a sense of life no it wasn't what they were what they came from but they weren't looking for that which they came from they were running from that so they ran to the, his arms and in so doing there became a kind of a ritualistic type of a breakdown of society's you know parameters the boundaries by which we all live under the circumscription of that's what we do these are the laws we live within this hierarchical society it was about none of that. He says, these are my rules. We're going to eat in the garbage. He basically got them, broke them down mentally to say, look, I, mean, I know what you rejected. I'm going to give you my version of what you want, and you're going to eat from it. And so as a result, they basically willingly did, the, 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 did what he told them to do. And it's not like he had to sit there and say, I've got you under LSD. Because LSD won't, see, this is the thing that people don't understand. Acid and LSD, which is the same thing, won't make you abandon your ability to discern from right from wrong, good from bad, love from hate. That doesn't, that is not what LSD does. What it does is it goes into your mind and it opens up your perception of things that you've experienced in your past and it delves through your memories and it starts to process them through and you look at them and you start to go reflectively speaking saying, 
wow, I was a real shithead with you 10 years ago. I got to make amends. I've got to clear this off of my chest. I have to cathartically go through all these things. And that's the process. It's the same thing with, ma with magic mushrooms. Those things don't provide you with a basis for mind control. And I can also say that what I'm saying is based upon what the CIA discovered 10 years earlier when they tried to use LSD as a drug that was going to be able to allow to facilitate mind control. And when it failed, the, the LSD experiments with the CIA went out the window and said, this is crap, this can't work, this can't facilitate where we're trying to go. And that's why it didn't wash. And people that come up with these theories are us asked and the drugs. It's like, yeah, right. And what do you know about it? Have you ever done well, I've learned it. You're basing it upon what? Research? But you haven't put yourself through the, the niche and saying, well, let's see what the thick this is about. Let's experiment and see personally, is this what it does? And as Ken Kesey did in 1966 with the electric Kool-Aid acid test, it proved that it had no ability whatsoever on a recreational level to do what, what they now say it could have possibly done which is gain the control over other people's minds to bring the veil down and to totally rewrite the script across their brain. What he did was, how should we say, he was a very manipulative, well-thought-out sociopath that knew what he was doing. And it was just like a, um, it was like a fringe benefit. Everybody was doing it, so it was popular in the time and people were smoking and dropping ass and whatever. That's just... That's just part of the story, but that's nothing to do with what caused them to do it. They basically did it out of love for Manson. Just kind of like the people 10 years later that went off with Jim Jones to with the People's Temple in Guyana to live away from society, to escape society's ills, to go down to South America to live on this communal, again, a communal type of, uh, of environment. And of course, the old saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely jim jones got a taste of the flavor of the flesh and figured out how he could control people and get them to do what he wanted using religion again religion right. didn't do it but he used it again as a sociopath to get them to come and do what he taught what he tried to instill to them to do a lot of the people didn't want to and as we later found out a great percentage of the people that were in Guyana did not willingly take the freaking Kool-Aid. They were injected with a gosh darn syringe and were killed. And that's the whole thing. People don't like to hear that because it means that, oh my God, the boogeyman is real. It's like, now is the boogeyman real? The boogeyman still exists. The boogeyman still can, 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 can touch anyone that is not able, that is weak. That is weak, that is looking for somebody else to be their crutch. When you can find people that are not able to, in their mind, be okay with themselves, they look for others to put their attention and their power and say, you can do this, I can put my faith in you. Look at the Catholic Church. People put their faith in the priest, and the priest knows that he's, you know, above it all. And what happens? He takes advantage of it because it's kind of like, the church won't let me sleep with women. Well, what do I have? I have desires. And the irony is, is I mean, I mean, I don't want to segue too far, but the, the, when you look at the origins of things, and the example being the talking about the church, is where that came from. Why were the priests denied the access to women? Well, when you look back historically, about a thousand years ago, in the early church, the priests were able to marry. Well, if the priest is able to marry, the priests have kids. And in the old days, you had you were able to, as the as the as the um, father to the son, you bequeath your land, pieces of your land. Well, the land was the church's land, and the priest having kids would have to then say, all right, I have to give you 10 acres of my land. Well, that's taken from the church. And the church said, you know, saying if this continues and priests are able to marry, we're going to have no land. Again, M-O-N-E-Y was the reason why priests were, were basically summarily at, in, at a certain point, 12... 1200 AD that when they said no now the church says priests can no longer marry because the land's being lost to the priest kids so you got to look back and say wow that's crazy it's like the same thing absolute power corrupts absolutely it's like yes 
because there's no the, the, the idea that you have all these these young women around you he's 28 years old these girls are 10 years younger than him and they're running around he can control them it's entertaining and instead of just him sleeping with them he decided as a sociopath is saying all right you and you i want you two to sleep together but but but, but that, where's the game to, to, to manson control it's all about breaking down their ability to decide for themselves what's good and what's bad and because he tells them and they think he has their best interest at heart they're going to do what he asked them to do so it's it, again it's not like this it's a it's a process by which you start out incrementally going dun, 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 so that you go from the from this place to here to the top and you go wow that's amazing it's like yeah it's it's basically the erosion of the individual slowly working it whittling them down and making them start to to disarm and to lose the senses of of, of, of the ability to discern and to to, to to be empath to have empathy towards others and as you start to break that down you can then start to re rewire and re give them a direction so that they will do on behalf of you because they feel like you are them you're there you're going to protect them and that's really what the story behind the manson the the clan and was concerned you know you, you got to remember that the few of them that you know as they got older their story didn't change for about 10 years so when you look at the interviews with Lynette squeaky farm or susan hopkins who in 1974 five years after the murders later said you know, we were supposed to go kill everybody in the other houses on the block where Sharon Tate's house was. Manson's original orders were to kill everybody at the end of the street, the house next door, the house next door to my house. And by the way, if you guys want, I can go upstairs and grab some of the, the old black and white photographs that I have from the LA Times photo archives to show you just what I'm talking about. It would have been a horrendous bloodbath had they not, as she said, been exhausted from the commission of the crime at the end of the street. Because there would have been another house, two, three, three other houses that would have also been having the same kind of murderous rampage go through that. The people that are writing these god-awful books, outside of the Helter Skelter book, are coming up with their theories because the cottage industry has blown its top the stack has been blown off of it because you gotta remember before manson died there were a few books i think there was a few books and feet and documentaries about the murders but very few that were really laden with thick facts one video or there's a, a documentary out there called manson and it's sick and i mean sick in the sense that he was there, he put up the camera in Spawn Ranch in the, um, I forgot the name of the room that they used, but it was a room that was to them very important and they had the table and the kid, the Lynette Squeaky Farm was interviewed and they were so spot on honest about the commission of the murders, about Manson's, Manson's preachings about um, Armageddon and the end of times and this and that and the upcoming race war and stuff and they're gonna all have to vacate to the desert and she, they, they're literally putting their rifles on the on the table or next to the table and saying yeah if I have to kill somebody I don't care it's either me or them and I'm like one and it's it's chilling because you're not watching an actor report and retell what these the script is these are the real individuals that were there and it's not central casting these are the people speaking the words present day and when i say to people if you want to talk to the freaking people at the parole board about these people coming up for parole all you have to do is show them video footage from them and say this is the people this is their mindset I don't care in 50 years that they've changed their mind and now they've become repentant, blah, 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 blah. The fact of the matter was they were all 
sentenced to die in the gas chamber in California in San Quentin jail and uh, civil brand it was all going to be San Quentin because that's the only place they had the death chamber in in California's um, correctional institute that was the place where the death chambers were and by an act of the California legislature in 1971 when they reprieved the death penalty all those on death row had their life sentences returned back to the regular time in jail and gave them the opportunity for parole and I said wait a second these people had admitted the commission of the crime they admitted their guilt why would you allow a blanket state you weren't just saying all oh, these people are going to say no it should have been on a case-by-case -case state study or review and on those the, the cases that had this type of preponderance of evidence and admission of guilt should have been they will not ever ever have an opportunity for seeking parole they are now commuted to life sentences with never the possibility of parole and that's where it should have happened then but they didn't so every four or six years one by one they keep coming back into the public foray and they're up for parole and i don't care how much they've changed what they did what they said then counts more than what they think now i don't care their commission of that crime and the heinousness is is without a doubt the most callous act of a cowardice and of, of lack of empathy or concern i'm sorry but some people don't deserve ever to put themselves back out there it wasn't an act of passion which i could say fine that's not you're you're not predisposed to kill anyone else that was that person who you're in, in the mix of but in this case no no i'm sorry you can't you can't it wasn't one person it wasn't two people it wasn't seven people that we know of there are the countless others that we didn't find out about and one of them being shorty shay who was the caretaker at spawn ranch whose body was found i want to say like 15 years ago now where his remains were found in pieces up in the Santa pass not too far from spawn ranch he was the one that was they was there when the police came to spawn ranch to raid the ranch he gave them the 411 on where things were on the premises and charlie famously said he goes we know you you talked shorty we don't like talk we don't like squealers you're gonna and basically a couple months later he disappeared just vanished never found and that's the thing about manson there are countless murders that are unsolved to this day 55 years later that are completely connected to him and missing persons reports of kids that went and disappeared in that era around here that they never understood never could figure and solve those crimes coming back to manson a lot yeah. more than we know of <laughs> the way you present it's like yes i used i have newt and i buried <laughs> it in the concrete so i've got that going to me too no, um, <laughs> But I, but I, but I, yes and no. I mean, but but there's nothing unique about steel in, in construction nowadays in the hills. Honestly, the house next door to me, going that direction, that's brand new, has got steel in it up the wazoo. The idea is, is that yes, I have a little uh, out of the traditional framing of a house, which was usually wood. There's the structural engineer who my father employed when he designed the house because of the earthquake conditions wanted to make sure that it had a little bit more rigidity than just wood framing. So he had him install three steel columns connected to two steel I-beams that went across the floor of the, the third floor of support. And then the same repeated three steel columns and two steel large steel I-beams to support the second floor. And again, this was never done with the intention of, uh, actually say, building the house like in 13 ghosts. This wasn't built to create a super dynamic environment where the magnetic fields would be bouncing around the whole entire entrance and in, in as the framing of the interior of the house. He did it because he says that will make the house a much more substantial, you know, to withstand much more substantial earthquakes and tremors. And what's funny is, when we have the earthquakes in LA that people talk about, I have yet to feel any of them. 
The only time I ever felt my house shake was when the gas turned on and what was it, when the uh, space shuttle came down and pierced through the clouds and they had that sonic boom when it came into the desert a couple of years, it was like 15 years ago or whatever, the house sh shook like violently like this, what the, is that? The sonic wave, the sonic boom was so proud, pronounced. But during the earthquakes that we've had, the few that, that have been around, my friends were going, did you feel? I said, feel what? I didn't feel anything. Now, what's interesting is, is we had an earthquake a couple weeks ago, and I thought to myself, oh, wow. I went into the, the den, and I saw the figurines on top of the canopy on the aquarium. Two different figurines were knocked over, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's great. I said, I've never seen those two get knocked over. Mind you, it was not any of the figurines that have always been knocked over by the spirits. So when I reviewed the footage, I was like, oh my God, what time is it? And it's at 11.30, and it's like, oh my, oh my God, that's what time the earthquake shook. Turns out the earthquake, the, the, the house, you could feel, you could, it was a slight jolt. It's a little rumbling to it. And it knocked over two figurines. And I said, that's great. So I saved the footage for one specific reason. Because I have that, and I can show it against all the other footage of all the figurines getting knocked over, and you can see the way that the whole room shook, and that the aquarium shook just enough, and the figurines that got knocked over are not the figurines that are always getting knocked over by the spirits. Yet those oh, no. by the spirits were standing tall and proud, and it's like going, wow, that's that's kind of the telling st statement to say here. Here's footage when an earthquake hits, and look what got what happened. And yet, when it's no earthquake, look what's happening. That's why I said juxtapose one against the other. You go, wow, that's 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 hard to argue with. There's something that you can't explain because you would have thought that the figurines that keep on getting knocked over by activity would have been the ones getting. It's like no, and they're standing. So it's like something about this is interesting. Plug and play. <laughs> right. Well. Because think of it this way, when you go into, it's almost like the basement, because the number one floor is always going to be your top, your, your ground level floor. Ground level, yes, I should say in my case, street level, because it's a downward slope like this. So you got your top floor here on street level. And instead of building up, which is taking it, which is basically adding more weight and not taking advantage of the, the space that's vacant below the top floor, why build up if you've got plenty of empty space and you've already created uh, two walls or three walls on and you've got this empty crevasse going down the hillside, why not take advantage? And originally the house was only supposed to be two stories. And as you go down the slope, basically each one of these layers gets shorter and shorter till you get to the bottom and there's at the very bottom of, under the house. There's probably about 30 feet of dead space still there that you could have taken advantage of. And I said, secondly, from a structural standpoint, putting more ribs across this so that it's not just one, two, and then this big open cavity, you're really becoming more structurally sound and it has more strength because the ribs going across are basically giving you a greater sense of structural integrity to the house. So I convinced him, I said, Dad, you can't just give two floors. They said, you got another space, and you still got this big, vast cavity of empty space there. Then he goes, all right, fine, we'll build a third floor. So we built the third floor, and he goes, look, I'll give you the opportunity later on, if you want, to develop a fourth level that's separate from the first three floors that are interconnected through the stairway and the spiral staircase so that you can actually have a storage space there if you want to do it down the road. Because you still, again, you have your ceiling, you have your three other walls on all three sides, and all you'd have to do is put a floor there and put a wall against the dirt, and there you've got another a storage space type of a, of a room. I said, okay, that's good. I said, but that's better. So I, as I told people, I said, you can't go three, two, one, because that doesn't matter. How could you say the third floor is the top floor? It doesn't work. He said, the top floor has always got to be the first floor. And that's why I say this is the first floor, the second floor, and the third floor going downward. And most people can't, you know, comp understand that because mm -hmm. most people's homes are built on a flat pad of land, and one, two, and three is going up. <laughs> so in this case, it's the exact opposite. You have your top floor, which is from the street level out, which is about 2,000 square feet, 
Then your second floor is about, oh, I'd say about a thousand, gotta be a thousand, two thousand, two thousand, gotta be about fourteen hundred square feet. And then the third floor is about six hundred square feet. More than 600 square feet. No, really, it isn't. It's about 600 and seven, maybe 750, 800 square feet. And that's the whole point, the, the reason why people don't quite comprehend it's like, because your first floor, your second floor, and time to your third floor is how it would work. And of course, the earth and wall room, a lot of people are perplexed at going, why is the earth exposed? They said, well, the reason why there's an earth and wall room is because my father at the time, when I suggested let's build the third floor, wanted to turn the third floor into a separate apartment. I think that the whole house is in its own unique way. It's the whole entire area space within the confines of the walls of this house that have places where intermittent, how should I say, um, the overlap between that dimension and this dimension presents itself. And I, I, I kind of tend to, to pull back from this one spot or this one spot. Why? Because it becomes too, for lack of better words, becomes too constrained. I mean, so you mean that can't be a place? Like, no, that is like, no, I'm not saying that that can't be a place where it's a portal, but if people are like, but right here, it's like, right now it is. Right now, you had that experience there. Doesn't mean that it's going to be there over and over and over. It's always shifting. And that's why I've learned in the house. When I used to say, oh, the most active part of the house is the third level. And then I'd have people come over and all of a sudden I'm starting to have weird sensations and feelings of lightheadedness and, and, and a different type of an energy type of a feel on the top floor. And I go, well, so much what I thought I knew, it doesn't happen to bear witness to the truth. And they say, why is that? I said, because Sometimes it's the second floor. Sometimes it's the end of the hall where my laundry room is. Sometimes it's the doorway going into the bathroom area on the first floor. Sometimes it's on the third floor. Sometimes it's in the earth and wall room. Sometimes it's in the theater room. Sometimes it's in the guest bedroom. It's, it, it's kind of like as a human being, as humans like to do, we have to be absolutely positively verify that this is it. This is the ob this is the object we're after. It's like, no. That's what I've learned is you have to be more open about it. It's it's more fluid in what's happening than we want to understand. We want to be we want a, a certain location, a certain decision. We want it to be very, very specific and very much in this box. It has to fit inside the box. That's why I've learned that it's not like that. That when we try to make that, there it is. It's like, oh no, it just moved to there. Oh no, there. it's like whack-a-mole. It doesn't want you to be able to figure it out in so many ways that you can scientifically say, all right, that spot right there is where it is. No, right there, right now it is. In two minutes, three minutes, it might be something else somewhere else. And that's what I've noticed. It's not like we can, um, how does it label it? And that's the thing is it's more fluid than, than, than we want to do. And in the fortunate, people want this to be the way it is, the way it is. And it's like, can't, can't do that. It just doesn't seem to want to play the game that we want them to play. Their terms, their decisions, people want to have the ability to know that I can count on this being the hot spot. So when I put that gosh darn dime on there, if it flips up on its own, then I was sure that's the spot. It's like, but what if I said that's not the case? And they go, well, that just doesn't fit. To, it doesn't fit my theory, which is what people have a problem with. We there is no such thing as an expert in the field of the paranormal. Why? Because as I just stated, it's it's so fluid that the theories are constantly change the and then it's like well that theory's out this theory's out it's like we are never gonna have the answer and i only say this because i after 17 years of living here i come to the conclusion that we're humans some things just just unfortunately we will never ever 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 know the answers to and it'll frustrate us it'll piss us off it'll It'll, it'll eat us up alive and we'll chase our tail to come up with the answer, but 
it's it's something that we have to grasp you know make make sense of understand like it's okay it's okay it's all right that we don't know but you have people out there that want to um profit off of the field and make the cottage industry their industry and make it big and make it brash and make it dramatic and make it scary and make it fearful and look after 17 years living here and having lots of my friends and people that I've met in the field come and visit and experience the stuff here i'm going to tell you that there's very little scary about the paranormal except for the people's perception and the 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 people's whose perception is tainted with a fear based or religious based type of a of a fear of like my god it's going to hurt me are going to give you that for people who are more open minded that are more willing to say let's see what the hell is happening here and instead of going oh my god did you hear that and overreacting it's like the idea that you have three you have three approaches to any situation the stupid approach the fearful <laughs> approach and the curious approach and that's across the board it doesn't matter if you you're walking through the woods and you come across a rattlesnake it doesn't matter if you go to the beach and you see see something in the ocean you don't understand it doesn't matter if it's between an argument between you and a friend you got to take yourself out of that place of being of being fearful and saying yes you know, I'm curious because here's the, the response you're walking in the woods and you come across a snake you don't know what it is but you see a snake this people approaches Oh my god, there's a snake. What the hell is that thing? I wonder. Let me go in there and do me go. Let me go see if if it's if it's if it's poisonous or not poisonous by touching it and grabbing it. No no sense of of self-respect, no sense of integrity, and no sense of fear. So you're you're putting yourself in harm's way, but you don't care. You're just blindly going along. Second response, the fearful response. Oh my god, it's a snake. It's got to be poisonous. Give me, can we find me a stone? Find me a stick. Irrational response. Not abil- no ability to be composed to kind of gravitate, you know, to kind of gradiate the situation to take it as it is. It's ten feet in front of you. It's not gonna jump ten feet and attack you. It's more afraid of you than you are of it, and you're not even thinking about the disparity of your 175 pounds. versus the the one pound of that animal and making that kind of correlation saying you know that 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 thing's going to jump and get me all right it's going to jump and get me from 10 feet away it's going to jump and get to an attack you why is it having an aggressive bend why do you feel that it you're it's a threat to you and why are you not able to be composed and deal with it the curious approach oh my god there's a snake all right that's 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 interesting now i i have to maintain composure because once i lose my composure and my ability to rationally deal with the situation i'm going to have nowhere to go but to fear and run and act accordingly so if i'm curious i'm going to sit there and look and say all right this snake um i don't know if it's a wild snake uh, let's look at its colors from a distance assess the situation come up with a plan of it uh, to, to, to how to deal with it be respectful of it put you get a stick and and you know get a long enough stick to touch it and see if that the basis it stands and starts doing this and then say okay you're a rattlesnake i'm no threat to you you're no threat to me please go along this the trail and out of my way and we'll both live happily ever after all right well that wraps up episode 1 here of our three part mini series and i do hope you all enjoyed and learned quite a bit from this episode because i know we did we have truly learned much more about Sharon Tate and Charles Manson than we had ever known before and we will learn even more on the next episode about Cielo Drive and its supernatural nature well once again we hope you have enjoyed this episode and of course if you wish to follow or contact us simply type in PIOT paranormal in google and you'll be able to find all of the outlets that we are connected to. As always, we would like to thank you all for tuning in. And until next time, stay frosty.